Now it is my privilege to introduce our presenter, Alex Eesmer. For those of you who know Alex, know that for a young man, he has an awful passion and love for the Lord, something that is all too rare in our youth today. So, it is, it's wonderful to listen to him speak. I can tell you from experience, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you, Clint. I was kind of ready to say all sorts of awful things about me. It's good to see all of you this evening. I'm glad you came. Came out and uh, weathered our main hurricane. Our topic for this evening is our day in Bible prophecy. But before we get started, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for each and every person that's come here this evening. Thank you that they desire to learn more about you and learn what you say about the last days of the book of Revelation. Please uh, send your Holy Spirit to be with us this evening and bless each person here. Please speak through me. Let everybody hear your words and not mine. And let us all leave here closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, it might seem a little strange, but it wasn't that long ago when the main form of long-distance communication was the telegram. I won't ask if any of you have sent a telegram, but I know I haven't. You know, you had to go to the post office and they would tap it out, and at the other end, they would write it and deliver it to the person you were trying to send it to. It cost a lot of money to do. It wasn't very fast, but it was the best that there was. And there were a lot of people that thought that the telegram would always be important. It was such a revolutionary technology. On the day of their successful flight, the Wright brothers sent a telegram saying success, four flights Thursday morning. But who here would send a telegram today? It seems ridiculous, right? I actually checked, you still can if you like the novelty of it. You know, who here could say, yeah, somebody sent me a telegram. But why would you do that anymore? We moved so far beyond the telegram. If you want to communicate with somebody today, you can call them, you can text them, you can Skype or FaceTime. There's so many ways to do it. It's clear that the future has arrived. Do we have any Star Trek fans here? You know, I haven't watched much, but I watched a few episodes a while ago, a few years ago, and something struck me as really funny. I'm watching this crew on their spaceship traveling five light years per second or whatever ridiculous speed they're going. And the crew is all sitting there at their stations, and every single one of them is wearing wired headphones. This is a world that they imagine that you can teleport people around, you have laser weapons, and that they couldn't think of wireless headphones. How many things do we have today that were unimaginable 40 years ago? But might it be that while we have all of these forms of communication, we're not getting the most important message that we have today. God's primary mode of communication with the human race is this book, the Bible. 66 books, some little, some big, Books like Jude only have one chapter, Genesis has 50, Psalms has 150. But at the end of these 66 books, there's one that speaks directly to us today. It talks about the last days in Earth's history. And I think that's why we're here tonight. The book of Revelation was written by John, one of Jesus' best friends. John was there when Jesus was baptized, he was there when Jesus was crucified, and he was there pretty much for everything in between. John was one of the early leaders of the Christian church. And when he was an old man, he was given the revelation from God, which we now sometimes call the apocalypse or the revelation. John wrote this book while he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos, a tiny little island off the west coast of Greece. John was a 
prisoner there because of his faith in Jesus. Revelation is intended to be God's message to a world at the end of time. The very first verse of the book of Revelation is significant. I know you all have your Bibles, so let's open them up to Revelation chapter 1. The last book in the Bible just before you get to your concordance and all the other fun things you might have to do. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent it and signified it by his angel to his servant John. This book begins by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was given by Christ to John to be written and given to us. It's given to help us understand who Jesus is. To help us understand the love and the character of God. And it's given to help us understand God's plan for the last days of this world. Look a little farther ahead to verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. What time could that be? The time is near. A little ominous, isn't it? Some parts of the book of Revelation speak directly to the people in John's time. But could it be that the greatest events in Earth's history are about to unfold? That the time is near to us now? You know, most people in the world agree that this world doesn't have much time left. You don't even have to be religious. Lots of people think, oh, no, global warming's going to get us and everything's going to be flooded. People worry about nuclear wars wiping out the face of the planet. Some people worry about aliens coming. There's lots and lots of ways to think about it, but nobody believes that this world's got a lot of time left. But when? When will the end come? Over the years, there have been a lot of false predictions made. Can we really afford to trust in another one? You know, the idea of the end seems so ominous, especially when you're talking about your home. The end of Earth, that just doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? But we'll find out today that when the Bible talks about the end, we're actually talking about the beginning. Because the best is yet to come. When the Bible talks about the end, it's talking about something positive. Because the end of this world means the return of Jesus. It's true. The Bible talks about a lot of challenging times before the end comes. But speaking of the return of Jesus is always a good thing. I want to take just a moment and we're going to skip to the end of the story. Turn a few chapters ahead to Revelation 21. Reading in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. So clearly we're talking about the end here, right? The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. They're gone foot. But now let's look at what comes next in verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then, who, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is the new beginning. 
the one that doesn't have an end. This is why we're here. So today, we can look forward to the end with hope, not with despair. A time when there will be no more hardship, no more difficulties and challenges that we often face. If Jesus is going to return to this earth, it will be the single greatest event in its history. The return of Jesus has inspired people with hope throughout all the ages. Let's look at the Old Testament, the book of Job, chapter 19. You can find Job about a third of the way through your Bible. It's just before Psalms, so if you get there, you've gone too far. We're going to look at chapter 19, and we'll start at verse 25. It reads, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Now the reason I chose this, a lot of people don't know it since it comes so far into the Bible, but Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before Genesis and Exodus. It's the oldest one. And even back then, Job looked forward to the coming of Jesus. The return of Jesus Christ holds out hope for a new life. And the book of Revelation tells us about that hope. Let's look at what Jesus said 2,000 years ago in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. You find it right before Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to read starting in verse 3. So I'll give you a little bit of background first. At the beginning of this chapter, Jesus, or Jesus had just told his disciples that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And to the disciples, the destruction of Jerusalem seemed like the end of the earth. One had to go with the other. Jerusalem was God's city. If it was destroyed, there goes the earth. So in verse 3, they ask him, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? That's what we're here to find out, right? How do we know when Jesus is coming again? You know, the funny thing is, Jesus answered the question we wanted to know. He didn't answer the question they wanted to know about Jerusalem. So keep your thumb there in Matthew 24, but we're going to take a quick detour to the book of 2 Timothy. We've got five T's in a row in the Old Testament. You've got 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and Titus. And then you've got the last few books before Revelation. So find those T's, and 2nd Timothy is right in the middle. We're looking at chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You see, I hope that at this series you will learn that the Bible is a book that we can trust. And as we learn to trust it, we'll also learn that it's God that has to guide our understanding of it. You see, we can respect our friends and our teachers and our pastors, and I hope you have a little respect for me. But the final say always comes from the Bible. Amen? If I tell you something that's not in here, I want you to call me out on it, because this is where we find the answers. So now let's go back to Matthew 24. 
And we're going to look at these signs that Jesus mentioned. Matthew 24, verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Do we have war today? Rumors of wars? In the last century, the last 100 years, more people have died from war than in the 2,000 years before that. Take a minute to wrap your head around that. World War I, 24 million dead, and the world thought it couldn't possibly get any worse. World War II saw 60 million deaths. Since then, we've had the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, Afghanistan, and that's just the ones the U.S. has been involved in. There have been conflicts across Africa and Europe. There's seemingly constant conflict in the Middle East. The United Nations was formed in 1945 to do something about this. The goal of the United Nations is world peace. That was 71 years ago. Does anybody want to guess how many years of world peace there have been in the last 71 years? Any guesses? One year, maybe? Half a year? No. There has not been a single day without an international conflict or a civil war in the last 71 years. Do we have wars? The rumors of wars? So when Jesus said, you'll hear of these things, is it possible that he was talking about today? When wars rampage the earth far more than we've ever seen in history? When we can't go a single day without trying to kill each other? Clearly, today is the day that he might be talking about. Let's go to verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Three more signs. Let's take a look at each of them. Famine. Jesus said there will be famines, pestilences. In the last decade alone, there have been a dozen food crises affecting millions of people. There are currently almost a billion people in the world that do not have enough food. That is one in seven. Every five seconds, a child dies from malnutrition and hunger. In the year 2008 alone, three million children died before their fifth birthday because they did not have enough food. This is a colossal tragedy. And here we live in an advanced world. You know, the average American wastes 220 pounds of food a year. A third of all the food produced in the world is either lost or wasted. And yet we have a billion starving people. Jesus said that there would be famines at the close of time. Pestilences, diseases. Two million people die every year from AIDS. That's somebody every 15 seconds. The Center for Disease Control says that there are currently 1.2 million Americans with AIDS. We can thank God for advancements in medicine, but 55 people a day die in the United States from HIV. In other parts of the world, the rate is much, much higher. There's no section of society that is immune. The Lord said there'd be pestilences, and we see them. 27 million Americans have heart disease. And there's probably a lot more than that that's not diagnosed. Because the way a lot of people find out they have heart disease is from a heart attack, and that doesn't always end well. 
26 million Americans have diabetes. 79 million more have prediabetes. And the number is not going down. We might not see these as plagues because they're so common. But that doesn't mean that they aren't. Everybody seems to know somebody who has diabetes or cancer. And there's 1.5 million new cancer cases in the U.S. every year. 600,000 people die from cancer every year in the United States. And it gets even scarier when you think about all the old diseases that are coming back. Recent years, we've had scares from SARS, Ebola, mad cow, and bird flu. Now we've got this new Zika virus to worry about. You know, tuberculosis still kills 2 million people a year in the world. If Jesus wasn't talking about our time when he talked about pestilences and diseases, it's pretty scary to think of what time he might be talking. Earthquakes. Matthew 24, 7 says that there'll be earthquakes. And you know, we just had a recent earthquake that moved an island six feet and killed 15,000 people in Japan. But if you remember the pictures of the tsunami washing people out to sea, there have been recent devastating earthquakes in Iran, Chile, New Zealand, and Indonesia. In 2004, we had an earthquake cause a tsunami, tsunami that took 230,000 lives. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Add to that 2005 in Pakistan, 80,000 people dead. 2008 in China, 70,000 people dead. And just in 2010, tragedy in Haiti, claiming 222,000 lives. In the last 10 days, Japan, Ecuador, and Burma have all been hit with earthquakes 6.5 on the Richter scale or higher. So do you think what Jesus said in Matthew 24 might apply to us today? Could we be living at the end of time? If these signs are anything to go by, I'd say we could. And then we can talk about the weather-related disasters. You know, two hurricanes combined, Rita and Katrina, caused $150 billion in damage and massive loss of tragic life. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Recently, in the Amazon basin, two of what they call 100-year droughts struck five years apart from each other. A hundred year drought is something that you can only endure once every hundred years. Half a million people were evacuated from the edge of the Yangtze River in China due to flooding. These are historic, biblically proportioned tragedies we're talking about. But Jesus said, you can expect these things before I return. Matthew 24, 37, Jesus says that as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So let's open our Bibles and see what the days of Noah were like. Let's go back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and we're going to look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Whether we're talking about the cartels in Mexico, the terrorists in the Middle East, or the criminals that live in our own neighborhoods, it seems like people are doing a good job of dedicating their lives to sin and violence. And Jesus said that it will be like it was in the days of Noah. 
Genesis 6, 11 tells us the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Does that sound like the day we're living in? It's sad to say, but it kind of does. 1999, 15 people were killed at the Columbine school shooting. Most people have never seen anything like that before. And we wonder how it could possibly get any worse. And in 2007, we did. And 33 people were killed on a university campus in Virginia. Experts now claim that we have a major school shooting every two months. And not only that, we have to worry about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram. We've got the shootings in Norway, the bombings in Boston and Paris. All these horrendous acts that fill the news constantly. I just looked it up today. In the month of April this year, there have been 358 people killed by terrorists in April. And we're only two-thirds done with the month. Is this an earth filled with violence? Then 9 11 happened. And you know, nobody thinks it could happen again, but clearly we're worried because I just came back from the Philippines and on the flights back, I had to go through security 13 times to get from there to here. Every time you go to the airport, you're reminded that we live in a world that has been irreversibly changed. We're never going back. And still it seems like politicians are willing to push us to the very edge. Now you might be tempted to say, well, it's always been like that. I mean, sure, things are bad, but we've always had famines, we've always had wars, we've always had earthquakes, we've always had violence. Cain and Abel killed each other, or Cain killed Abel, and ever since then it's just been bad. Matthew 24, verse 8, tells us that these signs are the beginning of sorrows. Now, it's a fun thing here that the word that's translated sorrows is actually the word for birth pains. So, what do we know about that? I Me, mean, not that much, but I think a lot of you probably have a pretty good idea. What happens when a baby's about to be born? The contractions get closer and closer and closer. And they also get more intense, right? Until finally you have your little bundle of joy. But Jesus said that the signs of his coming will be like those birth pains, getting closer and closer and more and more intense. Could it be true that the earthquakes and the famines and the wars, the, the rumors of wars that we're talking about, are getting more and more frequent? I don't think there's any doubt in that. So how do we feel about this? Should we be afraid? Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. He said when these things begin to happen, don't look at those things. They're not good. Look up. Your redemption is near. In spite of the severity of the things that are happening in the world around us, Jesus says that now is a time for hope. Because his coming is near. If we're seeing the signs of the times, we have evidence that Jesus is coming soon. This is a time for hope for you and me, because one day soon, this world will be gone. And all the sin and pain that we've had to endure will be forgotten. There will be no more temptation, no more death. Crime will be no more. Amen? Now let's turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Daniel's back in the Old Testament. 
a few books after Psalms. If you get to Hosea, you've gone too far. It's right after Ezekiel. The prophet Daniel gave us more signs to look for at the end of time. We can find them in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. It says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal my book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, I think that when, we talk, when Daniel is talking about knowledge here, he's mostly talking about spiritual knowledge, understanding of the Bible. But I think that he's also talking about secular knowledge. And I think it's pretty easy to say that secular knowledge is increasing at an unbelievable rate. This is a 5 megabyte hard drive in 1956. It weighed 2,000 pounds and you needed a forklift to carry it around. I suspect that a lot of you have a phone with 64 gigabytes in your pocket. To put that in perspective, you are carrying almost 13,000 times more memory in your pocket than that forklift could lift 60 years ago. Has knowledge increased? This was one of my favorite things to study in school. This was the first field transistor from 1947. It's a simple device, or so it seems, but it has changed the world. So this is the model of the first one. Every piece of technology we have is built on this transistor. Anybody care to guess how many of these are in your smartphone? You know, not many of those would fit, but they've gotten a little smaller. To the point where the newest smartphones have one billion transistors in them. Can we even picture a billion? It is really hard to imagine how small those are. So clearly, knowledge has increased. I remember when I was little, that wasn't that long ago, we used to have to take our film to Piggly Wiggly to be developed. When was the last time you developed film? The first computer I ever had took a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, if you can believe that. You realize that I am older than the internet? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I can't remember, but some of you may remember getting up and walking across the room to change the channel on your black and white TV. And today we live in a world with digital cameras, Smartphones and satellite dishes. We have email and texting. You can see anybody around the world on your screen in a matter of seconds. And there's no question that technology will keep on developing. What will tomorrow's innovations bring? Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, tell us to take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. You know, it wasn't that long ago that Jim Jones led 900 people to their deaths in South America. And he was a respected member of society. He had endorsements from people in high places. David Koresh said, I am the Lamb, and his followers today still believe that he was the Bunny. There are cult leaders false teachers, but there's no need for people to be deceived. If you put your faith in God and in the Word of God, you'll be on solid ground. I want to encourage you in this seminar to pray and to read your Bibles, because this is where the answer is found. Follow God's leading, and He will make things clear. The Word of God will give you hope, even as the world spins out of control around you. There's power in this Word, and power 
of his promises. Based on what we read in the Bible, the final prophecies in the book of Revelation are about to take place. In this day of advanced communication, we've moved away from the telegram, we moved away from things like pagers, but let's not move away from the Bible. While we're getting a hundred emails and a thousand texts a day, it's important that we remember to get the message that matters the most. And that is the message found in the Word of God. We can put our faith and our trust in Jesus today. He is the same as he was when he was here, and he'll be the same someday soon when he comes again. And that is what the message of the Bible tells us. All God offers is everlasting life to anyone who will accept it. It was just over a hundred years ago now, the, the Titanic sank in the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean. We all know the tragic story, but how many of you know that almost a dozen warning messages were sent to the Titanic and ignored? History has an interesting way of repeating itself. In 2012, an Italian cruise ship called the Costa Concordia ran aground on rocks near a tiny island off of Italy's west coast. The captain of that ship didn't follow the map he was given. And 4,000 people were on that cruise. 33 of them lost their lives. If you follow the map that God has given us, the map of the Holy Bible, you're not going to run aground. If you follow the Holy Bible in Earth's final days, you'll never end up on the rocks. The signs all around us tell us that these are important days, but if we follow the map, we'll make it safe at home. If you believe that we're living in Earth's final days, and you want this to be your guide, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand with me right now. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the map that you've given us. Thank you for the signs of your coming. And thank you that we can know that you're coming soon. Please draw us up closer to you so that we'll be ready for that day. And please make it soon. In Jesus' name I pray.